Um, all right, can you all see that opening slide there? Yeah. Great. Um, obviously, you guys know we're talking about the SWIM library. Um, so we'll jump into the agenda. So we're going to give a quick overview of schedule to mostly give you a sense of um, that we're early in the process and there's a lot of design left to be done. Um, we want to recap the pre-design process that we went through with SQUIM that kind of got us into the early phases of design and the um, sort of planning and programming we did with the SQUIM team. Um, and then give you an overview of the schematic design and where it stands today. Um, a brief note on cost and then <clears throat> give you all the opportunity to provide some feedback um, on where we are today. So looking at the schedule, um, I assume you guys can see my mouse on the screen, but we are here at the end of September, um, which for us is the end of our schematic design phase and Emily, um, said correctly that that is about 30% of the design phase complete. Um, so we just had community meetings in SQUIM earlier this week and we'll kick off into um, design development that'll run through about January. And that's kind of the time where we'll start to submit for a building permit with SQUIM. And then after that, through the spring, um, we'll work through construction documents. We're really, um, detailing the building and how all the pieces will actually go together so that come end of May, we'll have a construction set or a bid set that's ready to go to contractors. Um, we'll bid on it. Um, and then construction should start in the summer of 2023. Um, so really, this is all to say we are only here. Uh, this is a great time to provide feedback and there's opportunity uh, to make modifications to make sure that the building we deliver is going to meet the needs um, of SQUIM and the community. Um, so recapping the pre-design process, one of the first things we went through with SQUIM is to define um, really what the project goals are and some design principles that we can yeah. hold fast to as um, design changes and needs change that we can always look back to whether design decisions we're making are achieving um, sort of these key design principles that we've set um, in the beginning. So one of the first ones on the top left here, we're talking about sight lines. Um, that's really twofold. It's to make sure that staff and um, librarians can have a good view of what's happening in the library and who's there. It's to give patrons the opportunity to see where they're trying to go and what services they might be looking for in the library. Um, and there's also a desire to improve um, kind of sight lines from the city of Squim and the community towards, um, towards the library to have a recognition of um, where you are and that you're at the library. So that's kind of the goal with that sight lines design principle. Next is access to the exterior. For those who haven't been to the SWIM branch right now, the building is really closed off to the exterior. So once you're in it, um, there's no great way to get back outside. So a desire to improve that access to make more of the site functional for library program. Um, there's a goal to um, separate activities that are not compatible next to each other. So it's really to think about where is active noisy program happening? Where do you wanna be able to have a, um, a fun, laughter filled story time while also allowing people who want to study quietly or read the newspaper to kind of coexist in the library. Um, so making sure that we're smart about where certain program elements go. Um, flexible space, this comes out of some of the compromises that Emily was talking about. So in the hope of making fewer compromises, it's really looking at um, designing spaces that can serve a multitude of needs and can they be flexible to change based on um, what kind of event or program wants to be happening in the library. Um, and then on the bottom row, daylight. So um, there's a whole lot of research about how good daylight is for our well-being when we're inside buildings. Um, and today there is very little daylight in the library. So making design decisions that improve access to daylight um, for anyone spending time inside the building. Similarly, um, creating views to the outside. So 
connecting people who are in the building back to the site and to nature, and then also providing a connection visually between kind of people who are maybe on Squim Avenue looking towards the library to get a sense of what's happening um, and what kind of fun programs are happening at the library. Um, second to last here is movement. So wanting to make sure that um, it's intuitive and clear how you wanna be moving through the library um, and also making sure that we're designing kind of a universal access and barrier free, um, not just entries, but kind of the whole movement through the library um, is accommodating for all. Um, and then last but not least is designing so that we can provide after hours use um, to a, to a larger meeting room so that the community has access um, after hours, um, similar to how we were doing before the pandemic. Um, so that's an overview sort of of a lot of the principles that we'll tie back to as we start to look at um, how we actually design that library. Um, a quick look at the building program. So this is starting to consider how much space the library has on the left. Um, so this big blue bar that's collections, um, the children's area and the light blue kind of in this darker orange is the current space available for reading and gathering. Um, in yellow is the, the group activity room or that community meeting room that's available today. Um, and in the gray staff area and support space. And so as we went through programming and pre-design with SQUIM, um, and trying to land at a kind of that program compromise from the 17,000 square foot library that was the goal at one point to something that more reasonably fits the budget from um, the grant money. Um, we landed at just over or just under 10,000 square feet. Um, so we're seeing some growth in the collections, um, but sort of the biggest areas where we're seeing growth is in that orange, so the reading and gathering space um, and group activity or meeting rooms in the library. And then we've also got some growth in the children's area um, and trying to give the staff quite a bit more space. If any of you have worked out of the swim branch, um, you know it is really squeezed work area. So making sure that there's adequate space for um, all staff to be working. Um, and then another piece for us to consider is to really understand how the Squim branch sits within the broader community. Um, so here in the in the darker black is the is the Squim branch library, and we've started to highlight some um, kind of community programs around that area, and how the Squim branch library really um, kind of supports and is connected to. Um, those elements in the community like the YMCA and SWIM and the public schools that are nearby. So to really understand um, how the library fits into this network of um, public program and service. Um, and then this is a site aerial of the SWIM library to get a little bit closer um, to the actual building. If you haven't been this um, running along the west side here is Squim Avenue. The Squim High School is across the street. Um, and then a uh, church across the way to the north. And then we have all this um, really great open space around um, the sides of the library, some of which the library owns. So that's a really great benefit um, that you'll see kind of as we move into the design is trying to take advantage of the fact that um, the library owns this large property towards the east, um, knowing that we have great views to the south, but we won't always have control over how this property gets developed. So um, trying to keep in mind that it might not always be an open field. Um, and then highlighting a few kind of site elements that have relevance. So the Olympic Discovery Trail, um, that comes past the library and the various modes of transportation people use um, on that that might pass by. And then um, I think Emily is always the first to say that the Irrigation Fest is the longest standing continuing festival in the state of Washington. Um, and so to recognize that kind of the irrigation ditches that run through SQUIM have had a long history and how um, SQUIM has developed as um, and grown and so recognizing that um, we have one of those irrigation ditches running um, just west of our 
library side. Um, so then here's a diagram from pre-design about how we started to think about site organization. Um, so we went through quite a few iterations to try to think through how uh, we can develop the site to kind of improve some of the pressure points on site and really create um, greater area for a public program. And so um, kind of the way that we've done that is to really focus the south and southwest portion of the site for pedestrian access. So this is and to the left of the page here would be Squim Avenue with the high school to the left of that. Um, so developing a pedestrian path so that you no longer have to walk through the parking lot um, to get to the front door um, and using it as an opportunity to reintroduce um, more native plantings towards the site. So today all of this um, is asphalt parking. So trying to get some landscaping um, and natural plantings back onto this site. Um, we have a small um, sort of public plaza towards um, the entry of the building where we have some seating nooks, an opportunity to maybe gather um, either before or after you're coming into the library. Um, then as we move towards the east and we have um, that great stage that allows so much program already, trying to kind of play off that in uh, developing the East as an area for outdoor gathering and outdoor program um, and uh, developing a play area. So a space where children can play outside safely and kind of to complement all of that, it's um, accepting the reality that still many people come to the Squim Library by car. Um, so wanting to separate car traffic from pedestrian traffic. We're shifting the parking to the north end of the site. We're moving the fire access um, to the north as well so that really all vehicles are staying out of the pedestrian path um, to make sure that if you're on foot, you're not really at risk of being hit by a car so that you're having to cross less vehicle traffic. Um, so those are some of the broader kind of site organization schemes that developed into kind of a site design. Um, and then we took a similar approach to the actual um, plan organization of the building itself. And so um, you kind of see this banding that we're developing through the building. Um, and it's starting to take into considerations a lot of those planning principles or design principles that we talked about earlier. So when we're looking at um, activity separation, um, kind of the approach that we've taken here is to try to co-locate um, all of that really active program towards the south end of the library. So you have the entry in a similar place to where it exists today. Um, there's the children's areas in here, that large gathering room, you'll see that in here. So it was a focus to try to get all of that program where um, you may be doing less focused tasks and you're um, maybe meeting with another person or you're hosting story time, that this is a place where noisy active program can exist um, pretty happily. There's a benefit that we have. Um, so this is the south side of the building. So we get a really great sunlight really all year long. And so another factor in thinking about how we organize the building is to consider um, kind of what portions of the program will really enjoy direct sunlight. Um, and then also recognizing that there's program like public computers that um, really don't want direct sunlight. And so um, this is a space where we have those program pieces that can allow for some direct light. Um, so then as we kind of step into the building, um, we have this band of lower shelving and this is really to support this approach to make sure that you have used the exterior from um, essentially any portion of the library and kind of these um, call outs that we've made for views to the outside. Um, our focus continues to be the east side um, because it's library property that we have control over. So it's really, um, this lens that kind of as you enter the building, you have these views towards the east with program happening through there that draw you through. Um, and then in sort of this middle band of the library is where we're really focusing a lot of the collections itself. 
Um, and then this northern band, so this focus zone, is where we'll start to show some of the study spaces and meeting rooms, a service desk, um, but a lot of the um, quieter, more focused pieces of the library program. And then at the very north here, a staff work area um, that has better access to an outdoor parking and loading area um, that can have some views towards the west parking um, and just a general really clear view through um, the whole library. So then the way that these sort of planning elements really factor into how we design a building, this is kind of a snapshot of what that site development looks like now that we are um, at the end of schematic design. So you can see the development of that pedestrian path um, from North Squim Avenue that takes you all the way to that entry. Um, we're introducing new planting. So here we're proposing some carry oaks um, along with other native plants to bring um, kind of those native landscapes back to the site. Um, we have those little reading nooks that we talked about, um, a drop off area so that if you're um, coming just to drop a book or someone is dropping you off at the library that there's a space to do that. Um, and then we have sort of this path that can take you towards that east plaza um, and the performance stage on the east end that really highlights the opportunity for outdoor gathering that we have um, at this library because the site is so generous. Um, and then towards the north, a lot of that parking um, and vehicle access that we talked about. So we're, um, or NOAA is working um, with the church that's towards the north through a parking agreement. So you're seeing um, kind of drive through access here at the west end and again towards the east end of this drive aisle um, to provide additional parking beyond just the sort of code minimum that we're providing on site. Um, we've got some loading with direct access to the staff area back here. Um, and then here in this little corner, you'll see it in the floor plan on the next slide, but the children's area is um, right in this east end of that south bar. And so it has a direct connection to a fenced um, outdoor play area that then farther connects to this broader um, east plaza, um, kind of facing towards that natural landscape end of the site. Um, so then stepping into the building, the way that these pieces play out, um, and here we're recalling some of those um, colors from that original diagram from pre-design about how we've organized the space. Um, so the entry we've maintained um, pretty closely to where it exists today. Um, Right after that is where we have this gathering space. Um, we've called it social gathering in the past, but we really think of it as the living room of the library um, where you can come and read or use your laptop or maybe you're meeting a friend and there's space for you to do that. Um, over from that is the larger activity room. Um, so if there's an art class or an author reading, this is a space where um, you can enclose and have a meeting room. Um, something we've talked about quite a bit in SQUIM is the need to be able to host larger events. Um, so one way for us to kind of achieve that without um, just dedicating a lot of floor area to large meeting rooms that might not get used all the time um, is to really, you can see them a little bit indicated in these two corners, but using operable partitions to kind of allow the meeting room to grow or shrink depending on the kinds of programs that are being held. So if you're having um, Dan Brown come and read a portion of The Boys in the Boat and maybe all of SQUIM is coming out to see that there's opportunity to kind of open up this activity room to the gathering space. Um, and closing it off to the rest of the library so you can have a larger group um, meeting in this space. And then to the east of that is the children's area. Um, another benefit in having that adjacent to the activity room is that if there isn't a large meeting in there and you're having um, a really popular story time hour that um, if, it, if it does get too noisy in here, you can just move that into the activity room um, and you can have a large children's group um, 
having a tivity kind of right next door to their kind of dedicated space. And then um, past that, we have doors out to that outdoor play area that we were just looking at on the site plan. Um, we have individual user public restrooms kind of banded together in this block. Um, the hope of there is to A, provide accessible restrooms to everybody, but then also um, provide restrooms that are as inclusive as we can make them. And so that has been the driver behind um, moving away from gendered restrooms and providing just individual occupant um, restrooms for all public restrooms, um, kind of off that entry. And so when you're coming into the building for the first time, this is where you'll land. Um, you'll have clear views to the service desk right across the way. On the north end, um, we have some space dedicated uh, for display for the friends of the library, um, an opportunity for some shelving that might be movable or showing a flexible collection or staff's favorite picks. Um, <clears throat> but just kind of that first engagement that a patron might have with the types of programs and collections that the library is hosting. And then we're wanting to maintain a clear connection towards the east end of the site. So this really is the main um, sort of circulation aisle through the library past kind of the bulk of the collections that takes you out to this east facing reading room. And just north of that, we have um, a medium-sized meeting room, a couple of smaller study rooms, um, a dedicated sort of teens and tweens zone with the hope of trying to separate um, the children from the teens and making sure that each have space that um, they have autonomy and then they feel like they have a little bit of ownership of. Um, so that happens on that north band. Um, and then a few more collections before we get to the public computers area with proximity to the service desk so that um, staff can provide support if it's needed. Um, and then really beyond that service desk in the north end is all staff work area. So there's um, sort of that work room that's still open towards the service desk. Um, and then a shared office, a small meeting room, a couple of private offices and a break room. Um, to kind of divide that staff area. And then as we sort of go towards back of house, we've got some storage and um, kind of equipment and services that support just um, kind of operation of the building. Um, so that kind of gives an overview of plan organization and where that stands today. Um, looking a bit at how that building or that floor plan really translates into a building form. Um, if you've seen the Squim Library, it's a, it's a really unique sort of cross-shaped floor plan with um, indications of a gable roof above that. Um, as part of our design process, part of what we have done is try to study really the vernacular of Squim and what forms um, have had meaning in the Squim area and so it's hard to deny um, the, the farm architecture of the Squim um, and really northern end of the peninsula and the, the benefit of the gable roof that makes so much sense in large open volume structures like barns um, makes sense at libraries too especially when we think about um, storing collections and book barns as we sometimes call them but um, Really the focus here is to kind of maintain that gable vernacular for the main volume of the library. Um, and then we have this, you can see it here, this um, that south bar addition that we've been looking at. Um, that's kind of this flat roof form on the south and then reconfiguring the roof of the um, staff work area to be a flat roof as well. Um, when you look at the south elevation at the top of the page, um, you'll notice compared to, for example, the west elevation is that we're doing um, a lot of our glazing on the south elevation. So we have these big um, storefront glazing walls along that south bar to allow sunlight in. And then we're also doing the south facing roof dormers on the top of the gable roof. And the goal there is really to allow um, daylight into the deeper portions of the building. So when you look at this um, 
section. So this is where we've cut through the building. Um, you can kind of see that um, if you've been in the library, kind of this is where a lot of the um, collections is standing today and it's really dark and not much natural light comes in. So introducing these south facing roof dormers is an opportunity to really get daylight to penetrate deeper into the building beyond just the perimeter walls. Um, and then similar for the staff area where we know we're trying to do a lot more focused task work, really um, limiting ourselves to north facing glazing, which is um, far more uniform daylight, really all times of day, except for those really unique hours on like the summer solstice where the sun starts to make its way all the way around. But really 99% um, of the year, we get really great, really uniform um, daylight through northern glazing that's not um, conflicting or really glare inducing. So um, yeah, the hope there is to really bring balanced daylight into the building to make sure that um, people are comfortable um, and sort of enjoying that space. That's um, an overview of the, of the section and the elevations. Um, Emily mentioned that some of the funding for the library is through um, state grants. And so as part of a Washington state requirement is that all projects uh, with state funding um, meet LEED silver certification. Um, LEED stands for uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So it's really about um, making really sustainable buildings. And so um, that's a priority for the library. If you've never seen sort of a LEED scorecard, it's really a points-based system. Um, and so to achieve LEED Silver, we need to get at least 50 points out of these various kind of credit categories that exist. And so we just wanted to highlight a few of them um, that have a lot of alignment with where we are in SQUIM and then kind of what the library hopes to achieve. Um, so kind of that first one here and the bracket of sustainable sites is one about rainwater management. And so there's a goal um, on site. So today the library site manages all its rainwater and stormwater on site. Um, and even though we're expanding the building and are having to do more paving to accommodate that, the goal um, is to continue to manage all of the rainwater on this site so that um, we're not dependent on city infrastructure and we're able to more naturally re-infiltrate all that rainwater back into the soil and back into the groundwater. Um, so that's one that the design is really focusing on. Another is in this energy and atmosphere category. So this is really about um, using less energy um, and reducing our operational carbon. And so that first one that I've highlighted here is optimizing energy performance. And so the way we do that is about um, designing a really smart um, building envelope. So exterior walls, roof, glass to make sure that um, we're putting glass where it brings us value, um, but depending on opaque envelope um, where we're not getting much value out of glass because the, the glass um, is a lot lower performing than sort of opaque walls. So it's trying to be really thoughtful about where we glaze and where we don't glaze. Um, it's about building a really tight envelope where the air that we've spent money to heat doesn't leave the building um, or cold air comes in. So making sure that we have a really tight envelope um, and then it's specifying um, really efficient mechanical systems. So um, that when we do need mechanical heating and cooling that that's being done um, really efficiently um, and on this site without um, natural gas. So here, all the equipment's gonna be um, on electric power. Um, and then the second one we've highlighted in this bracket is renewable energy production. Um, so there's opportunity, um, especially in SQUIM, um, where the weather is that much sunnier than it is out here in Seattle. Um, there's opportunity for uh, producing renewable energy on site. And so um, this diagram that hopefully you can kind of make out on the right side of the screen here is a solar access analysis. 
Um, and so this was from a time when we were still studying um, a few different building forms um, and considering how um, each of them benefits or is detrimental given its solar access. And so um, really worth pointing out here is that this bright yellow um, that you're seeing on the south facing portion of that gable roof um, tells us that this portion of the building is a really great um, opportunity for um, renewable energy or uh, photovoltaic panels. Um, really it's as best as we can get. If you can see that kind of um, graph on the right, the yellow is at our very highest possible production. Um, and so by pitching the roof a certain amount and um, the building already being oriented um, almost exactly due south, the gable roof gives us really great opportunity to really benefit off that solar energy that's gonna be incident um, on that roof for a large portion of the year. Um, kind of starting on the right here. So if you can read that, this is about indoor environmental quality. So this is really about making spaces um, where humans are really comfortable. And that's both about using materials that are good for us or not detrimental to us and the VOCs that they let out. Um, so making sure that we're specifying really healthy products. Um, and then the others is about daylight and quality views, um, thermal comfort. And so it's really about designing spaces that um, we are gonna be comfortable to be in. And so um, part of that, we've talked a lot about daylight already. Um, this is really just analysis to back up um, where we are to date. So it's an, a solar or a daylight analysis that we um, use to study um, really where are we getting enough daylight, where are we getting too much, um, and maybe areas where we're not getting enough. Um, so what you're seeing here, maybe on the left side, um, this is where the restrooms and the storage are. Um, and it's this really dark red, which means we're getting zero daylight in that area, um, which makes a lot of sense because we don't need a whole lot of daylight in a storage room in comparison to when we look at the south bar. Um, we're starting to get into the light greens and yellows, so we're getting um, a pretty high uh, foot candle value, which is how we measure sort of light incident on a surface. Um, so we're getting it in the south bar. And then as we've talked about more of the focus tasks that are happening on the north side, we want to make sure that we're staying out of these bright yellows. So we're living more in the lighter blues, um, which generally is around 25 to 100 foot candles, um, which is generally the target when you're trying to do um, focus tasks like reading a book or um, working on a computer. Um, so an example of something we'll continue to work on as design progresses, you can see this little hotspot um, on the north end right here. So kind of as we develop design um, analysis like this tells us that this is a part that we got to work on to make sure that we're not uh, creating an issue. Um, so that's a really high level overview of some of the um, sustainable strategies that we're trying to implement at this um, library. And I think really the pieces to remember is um, we're trying to reduce um, our operational carbon and then we're trying to reduce our embodied carbon so that the carbon that sits in the materials that we are using and are bringing to the site. Um, and then we're just trying to make space that's really healthy for the people who are spending time in it. Um, and then some perspective views um, and renderings just to help get a bit of a sense of what these spaces might feel like and look like when you're in them. So at the left side of the page here is an aerial from the southwest side. Um, so you can see this pedestrian path that's leading in along that uh, colonnade of trees and plantings. Um, we've got some picnic tables from those reading nooks that sort of lead you towards that main entry on the west side. Um, you can see this, well, I don't know if you can see it. I can see this little person here. So we've got, um, she's with a bike. So there's some bike racks here. There's a bike fix-it station that we're planning for. Um, so just trying to get a little bit of sense of how these spaces will feel. You can see here those south facing roof dormers um, and kind of in addition to delivering really great daylight into the depth of the building, um, 
the other opportunity that they provide. Um, if you recall the site plan and how far back that existing building sits from Squim Avenue. Um, these really putting something bright um, sort of higher up in space really gives us an opportunity to be a signal um, as you're starting to approach the library site that um, there's something happening here and this is a place where you might want to want to be so kind of a physical indicator of the library. Um, then on the right here is a view of what your entry approach might be like as you're coming to the library. So now you're on that pedestrian path. Um, you can get a sense of seeing um, into the library and kind of our desire for blazing um, this whole portion of the entry is to really um, have a visual connection into the library towards that active program um, to give you a sense as you're coming up of the types of things that are happening in the library. Um, and then as you start to see through, you start to glimpse the exterior towards the east end where the children's play area is. Um, and then as you get into the library, so here on the left, you're maybe sitting um, in that gathering room, reading your newspaper. We've got those plantings um, and glazing towards the south side of the building. Um, and you're looking into that large activity room in this instance, right now it's opened up to the gathering room so that there isn't um, sort of meeting program happening in there. And then beyond that, past this glazed wall, um, you can see the children's area and the exterior beyond that. Um, on the right, you see you've um, kind of landed at the main entry of the library. You have your view to the service desk um, towards the north end here. Um, and this is that main circulation aisle that we we're looking at that guides you towards the east. Um, so you can see that glazed wall through there. We've got low shelving um, for the collections to maintain as much visual connection through the library as we can, um, and kind of leading you towards that reading room or reading space at the east end. And so. Um, here on the left, you've arrived at that reading space. Um, we're showing it here in some morning light um, with, you can start to glimpse it through the windows, um, but it's really a, a wood slat uh, sun shade screen um, to make sure that when we're introducing quite a bit of east facing glazing, um, that we're not dealing with excessive heat gain through that glass when the sun is hitting it um, and to make sure that um, we're managing the glare from that light um, before it becomes a problem. Um, so this is that reading room and then that east plaza through these double doors, um, which is the next image over. You've made your way to that east plaza and you're looking back towards the library. Um, this is that main gable roof and space that we're in on the left. And then out here in this protected um, corner of the building is where we're planning for the children's play area with the children's area um, just beyond on the interior. Um, so that I know is a lot of information, a, a broad high level overview um, of where the design is. Um, we're gonna talk briefly about construction cost. Um, so where we are today at the end of schematic design, um, the estimated cost for the building renovation and addition is right around $4.7 million. Um, we're adding an automatic fire sprinkler system to the building. So it doesn't have sprinklers today, but um, in the interest of uh, protecting the asset when we spend a lot of dollars, um, adding a fire sprinkler system provides a lot of protection. Um, so that's getting added. And then all that site development that you're seeing on the site plan, the estimated cost for that is about $1.2 million. So that kind of the base scope construction cost of the project where it stands today, um, is just under $6.1 million. Um, kind of these two elements that you're seeing below the line um, are options for some exterior storage um, and starting to put some numbers towards what those elements would cost. Um, but if you hold on to that $6.1 million number, that's really um, the cost of the project as we've presented it. 
Um, and with that, I think we are happy to open it up to any questions and feedback. Uh, 